Well, hello and welcome to the Godwit Podcast for another week. My name is Paul Smith. And I'm David Kowalik. And today we're going to be looking in the New Testament at atonement and what Jesus did concerning atonement and other things as well. Yeah. It's uh, kind of a well, difficult... But mostly atonement. Yeah, mostly atonement. It's going to be a difficult thing to talk about. And we were talking about this before we started recording, that a lot of the Western Evangelical Church, which I'm part of, has pretty much get, got the Old Testament and just obscured it or just left it at the door and s- sort of seen um, the New Testament sort of supersedes the Old and we don't have to worry about that. And you mm. can pick up a few nice stories out of that, faith-building stories, and it kind of gets left out. And a lot of preachers don't even touch it, which is which means that our view of the New Testament is going to be coloured when it is actually meant to be formed by the Old Testament. If we don't understand the Old Testament, then we're not really going to fully appreciate what's going on in the New. And that certainly applies to this subject of atonement because we've already been talking about atonement from the Old Testament and what that means. And then that that creates the ground rules for understanding atonement in the New. Yeah. So um, what can we say about that? Well, there's some real difficulties in um, addressing how atonement is expressed in the New Testament because what we've been looking at in the Old Testament is how there's different sacrifices mm-hmm. and uh, different uses of blood, etc. Mm-hmm. And there's times in the New Testament where they're all thrown together yeah. because um, Jesus represents all of them mm-hmm. and so they're kind of all conflated. Yep. But at the same time, we have to understand the different parts yep. that are being all thrown together, Yeah, um, which is where we start getting into tricky territory. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, again, we were talking about if you were in an anatomy class, uh, one of the best ways to understand the human body is to take it apart and to look at the nervous system and the blood system and the digestive system and so on. But in doing that, you kill the you kill the, the, uh, the, the if it was a living person that yep. you were studying, you'd kill them. But at the same time, it does help you to understand how life functions. Yeah. But then you have to also put them all back together. And I think what we've done looking in the old system is that we've seen how all the parts work um, in the individual rights. But then in the other, and I think when, say, John the Baptist in John chapter 1 said, uh, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that he was referring to all of the different lambs that Jesus represents, the Passover lamb, the lamb of atonement, the uh, fellowship offerings, the covenant offerings. There was blood in all of those Mm. things. And so in one sense we can say, yeah, Jesus is all of those things at the same time. But it it is helpful to understand how each of those things works discreetly so that then we can see how they work together as well. And I think one of the problems we have, well, I personally, I can speak for myself, is that in my younger years, I tended to see uh, all of the sacrificial uh, or the the Jesus being the Lamb of God merely as just the atonement and nothing else. Mm. And as time has gone by, I've come to realise, no, it's because of the Old Testament, it's a whole lot more complicated and more interesting and therefore more beautiful when we see that the blood is for covenant and for fellowship and for atonement and a whole bunch of other things at the same time. Yeah. So So we're going to look at the um, places in the New Testament because there are places in the New Testament where there isn't distinction made. Mm -hmm. There's just like all the ideas are thrown in together. Yeah. And Jesus fulfills all of it. Mm -hmm. But there are places where there is distinction made and it talks Mm -hmm. more specifically about, you know, for example, there's places where Jesus is referred to specifically as the Passover lamb. Yeah. And that's wanting to bring to mind um, what was achieved through Passover, Mm -hmm. the rescue from um, slavery and oppression. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that Jesus was only the Passover lamb, but in those passages is wanting to bring out that idea specifically. Yeah. There uh, there are places where um, Jesus being the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant is brought out specifically. Mm -hmm. We want to look at the places where the ideas of, Jesus' blood being for atonement are brought out Mm -hmm. specifically and to show that it's one component in the whole mix. Mm -hmm. And while they all do go together for the whole picture and you don't, we're not trying to take any parts out and say these aren't relevant, but we are trying to say this is a component of the whole picture. 
And why are we saying that? Because of the old te- uh, the old covenant, the Old Testament. If the Old Covenant and the Old Testament does that, and that is even if you take it just to be the sketch of things to come or yeah. the symbols of things to come, they're not they're not without meaning. They actually have real meaning. And so we ought to do justice to the meaning and the purpose of the symbols yeah. by taking them seriously and then then uh, translating that forward into the New Covenant and seeing how all of those things are fulfilled in Jesus because Jesus is everything that's included in the Old Testament, just so much more. Yeah. So uh, he's, he's the living being, whereas the other thing is just the sketch. Yeah. Mm. So to recap what we've talked about previously about atonement in the Old Testament, atonement is related to this idea of holiness, that we as mortal and sinful just like... Uh, deficient. We're, yeah, we're deficient. We're mm. not the same category of being as God mm. and can't just be in proximity and relationship and close to him yeah. because we're different. And atonement in the Old Testament um, was more related to that aspect. Yeah. So we've said that Passover wasn't atonement, covenant wasn't atonement, um, fellowship offerings weren't atonement, but there was atonement. Yeah. And so how does that factor into how is that how does the New Testament talk about Jesus mm-hmm. um, specifically in regards to atonement? Yeah. Which is related to um, being made holy, mm-hmm. this concept of holiness, being made holy to be able to access and come into proximity with God. Mm-hmm. Which in the Old Testament scheme for Israel, it came after the other ones, um, which meant that it was the community wasn't established by atonement. Mm-hmm. It was atonement came into maintenance of community. Yeah. It's like how does God dwell among um, an imperfect people mm-hmm. that he's already rescued, he's already made a covenant agreement with yeah. um, or covenant promises to. How does he dwell among them without destroying them? Yeah, And this is... If we remember, it's an ancient way of thinking and doesn't really compute naturally to modern no. to the modern mind. Although I've been parts of the world, even today, I've been parts of the world where it does compute. I should say to the modern Western mind. Yeah, modern Western mind. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah, to the modern Western scientific enlightened mind, it doesn't yep. compute straight away, which is probably why we've ended up with um, atonement theories that are more transactional and work on, oh, okay, this idea of a someone paying the punishment or penalty for someone else Mm. in a court setting Mm -hmm. because that makes more sense to us. But that's not what was going on in ancient Israel. Mm -hmm. And that foundation of atonement in ancient Israel was what is being referred to for Jesus in the New Testament. Although we'd have to say that the systems that they were familiar with in, in other cultures around them, in other tribes, was transactional in the sense that you trade, you know, you trade with God through sacrifice. Whereas the new, the Old Testament system, the system given as a gift to the Jews after they got out of um, Egypt, was not transactional. It wasn't trading. And so even though it looked superficially similar to the transactional way of sacrifice, mm. it was substantially different and was based on covenant promise rather than on some kind of contractual trade system, which other which other and and to this day these sort of systems still exist in many tribes around the world. Yeah. So it was already differentiated from the others um, and um, had similarities, but was very much distinct from the other systems. And now we have to make sure that we don't get back into this trading system because a lot of modern Christians have a trading idea in their head uh, concerning atonement, as if Jesus is paying off the Father and doing some transaction which we can't afford. And it kind of sounds superficially like it might be on the money, but it's not. It's miles away from it. Mm. So So if we look at the cultural climate of the first century, which is when the church began Mm -hmm. and when the New Testament was written, everybody did sacrifices then too. Mm. We we don't. Mm. I mean, in some cultures in the world, they still Mm. do. Modern Western culture does not have sacrifice to gods. Mm. So it's a foreign concept. Although it's in a way, you know, someone who's who has who is under um, some kind of an addiction, they are um, inadvertently making sacrifice of money and time and their health in order to get what they want out of their, you know, idol 
And so it's still there. It's just that we don't, we don't, it's not black and white. It's not systemized. Yeah. Mm. But this, um, the concept of atonement is more similar to say what you might find in the new age movement where there might be things like crystals or incense and the idea is to ward off evil. Yeah. You know, that kind of Mm. um, spiritual, spiritualized kind of, Mm. um, you do these ritual things that are supposed to purify the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, Most modern Western Christians don't have that. (laughs) Modern Western people don't have that. No. But the ancients did. So in the era of the New Testament, Mm. there were pagans um, that were doing all these sacrifices and offerings to pagan gods in a more transactional sense and Mm. appeasing and whatever. And then there were the Jews that still had the sacrificial system that was established for Israel um, in the time of Exodus and Leviticus. Yeah. So everybody was still doing sacrifices mm. and they understood that system. We don't have that system. Mm. So we have to look at it, understanding the context of Jesus being an atoning sacrifice is to a people that understood sacrifice. Mm. And it was answering questions that they had that we might not necessarily have in the same way, mm. which is probably why we've changed the question. Yeah. Modern Christianity has changed the question and got a different answer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the question for them was, okay, so specifically the question for them, I believe, was if there's a new system, which there is in Jesus, mm-hmm. there's a new covenant, a new way, so then how do all these th- things work? We understood how they worked in the old system. How mm-hmm. do they work in the new system? Mm-hmm. Because, um, okay, we've got a sacrifice of atonement that allows and the priesthood that allows people to have access to God. Mm. How does that work in the new system? Mm. Well, uh, why don't we um, begin to look at uh, some of the ways in which it works. Probably the the book in the Bible that deals with this most specifically, I'm just going to um, ask a question here. We're going to go straight to Hebrews now. We're going to go to Romans first. Uh, let's go to Hebrews first. Yeah, okay. So the book in the Bible that deals with this most specifically is uh, the book of Hebrews. And there's a lot of conjecture about who the book of the Hebrews was written to. Personally, I think it was written to the, the priesthood that was referred to in uh, Acts chapter 6. It says many of the priesthood became believers. And because they were, they were quite sophisticated, they understood the, the priestly system, they understood the sacrificial system very deeply. And the problem they were having was that they were being tempted by their community to go back into the old system and to reject what they had found in the gospel and in Jesus Mm -hmm. and to go back into the old priestly system of sacrifices. And they were even being persecuted, it appears. They were having property confiscated and there was even the threat of death was beginning to emerge amongst them. And so this letter was written to try to help them to see how the new covenant is totally fulfilling all of the things in the old covenant and therefore to go back into the old is actually to reject the new and to actually vandalize the good things that we now have in the blood of Jesus by replacing it with the blood of animals, which would be a retrograde step. Such a retrograde step, in fact, it was considered apostasy as far as the writer of of, uh, Hebrews is concerned. In fact, he warns them many times uh, systematically all through it, saying if we reject this, there's no hope. There's nothing outside of this. This is the only hope. You can't go back to the old system. The old system was good and it led to the new system, but now it's been superseded by the new. But there's all these connections. And so it's not like the old is kind of trashed and thrown away, but rather it's kind of the foundation upon which the new is built. And it's got lots of... um, continuity with the old, discontinuity as well because it's so much better and improved, but continuity in this, in what the symbols meant in the old are fulfilled in the new. Yeah. So therefore, there ought to be a correlation between the old covenant and the new, and that is what we do actually find here. Yeah. Mm. And when we look at Hebrews, when it talks, um, I mean, it has mentioned all the way through in different mm. parts, but the biggest chunk is in Hebrews 9 and 10 that talks about Jesus being the high priest and the atoning sacrifice and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When we look in these chapters, 
actually we should say that for the whole book of Hebrews, mm. the there's a continuing argument that Jesus is better. Mm. Yeah, he's better than the angels, better than… Well, it starts with, what's it mm. start with? From ver- chapter 1, verse 1, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, which is atonement, yep. he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Yeah. And then it goes on to a, on a discussion about how Jesus is superior to angels. Well, yeah, first of all, we have to say to a Hebrew mind, angelic vis- visitation and, and speech coming from an angel is considered like the biggest deal in the world. It was better than, than hearing a prophet. Yeah. It was kind of almost like hearing the voice of God. And then to say that Jesus is superior to those angelic beings is to say, wow, he is really high, bigger than the prophets, bigger than, than the angels. And it also yeah. says in Hebrews later that mm. um, the first covenant, the Mosaic mm. covenant, was mediated, mediated. by angels. Yeah. So he's saying, first saying Jesus is superior to the prophets. Mm. He's superior to the angels. Mm-hmm. Then it goes on to say he's superior to Moses. Mm-hmm. Which is, well, say that to a Jew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's superior to Moses. Wow. All right. He's mm. he's the new priest in mm. the order of Melchizedek, which mm. is superior to the Levitical priesthood, yeah. the, um, the priesthood in the line of Aaron, that his blood is better. Mm-hmm. It's better than Abel's. It's better than the mm. um, sacrifices offered in the first covenant. That he's a super- So it's just superior. The the, the, yeah. the overall biggest theme of the first at least mm. 10 or 11 chapters of Hebrews is Jesus is superior to everything in the old system. He, he, they're all like a shadow and literally says a shadow yeah. in there of um, what was to come and Jesus is superior to all of them. Yeah, and therefore you can have confidence in the new. The, the word confidence is often repeated in uh in Hebrews, and that word confidence is based on what we now have in Jesus. You used to have confidence in the old, and that was fine, but now that confidence has been replaced by a stronger confidence in Jesus. So now we have confidence to enter the most holy place, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, I think it is. Um, and and that confidence, if you if you go back to the old, then you've, you're actually saying no to this confidence, mm. and it's actually... Um, talked about as being a unforgivable sin, in fact, to say no to Jesus and to reject what we now have in the new covenant and mm. to go back to slide back. Backsliding in Hebrews is not about backsliding into immorality. It's backsliding into your confidence coming from your priestly system and from the old from the old sacrificial system when yeah. it's been replaced by the new. Yeah. Mm. So context is really important. Uh, a fair chunk of the New Testament is letters written to the new church mm. and they have different content for different reasons. Mm. Um, there's, uh, we're going to look at some of the places where this idea of Jesus being an atoning sacrifice specifically is mentioned mm. and context is important. And the uh, probably the biggest place in the New Testament where this is talked about is in Hebrews. Mm-hmm. And the context is to Jews, probably Jewish priests mm. that are, Tempted to go back to the old way, and which, so which the, is fair enough because not only were, did they have their religious system, but they were actually most likely very wealthy, yeah, and that their friends and their family were powerful, and they they, they weren't just losing their religion, their old system. They were losing their place in the community. They were losing probably inheritances, money. Some of them would have probably even got divorced over it. Uh, not that they weren't they weren't causing the divorce, but they're their spouses may have divorced them in order to keep their Jewishness pure. Um, there's even some conjecture that Paul may have suffered that, but that's that's a, another story we won't get into. But yeah, they they gave up a lot, yeah. and so you can imagine that the, that the the temptation to go back would have been really strong. In fact, uh, it actually talks about that in Hebrews chapter twelve when it says um, that we. Um, he says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. 
Now, obviously, he's not talking about resisting the temptation to do something immoral to the point where you pop a vessel in your head. He's saying, no, the temptation to go back to the sin of rejecting Jesus, to go back into your old system, uh, is very strong because some of you are actually under the threat of death. And you haven't even had to face that yet, he's saying. Some of you have already lost property there. She mentions that in chapter 13. But you haven't yet had to give up your lives for it. And yet Jesus gave up his life and his struggle against this whole, whole thing. Mm. So, um, but be encouraged that this is the real thing. It's superior to the old. And yes, you may have suffered. You may have given up a lot, but Jesus suffered and he gave up a lot. And he actually says that earlier in chapter 12, be encouraged. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the pain of the cross. And now you likewise should en- endure the pain and the suffering that you're now suffering from the, the, the rejection coming from your community because there is a joy set before you. And what's the joy? It's fellowship with God. Mm. So, good tidings. So, that's the context okay. of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. Actually, there's an even longer discussion. Yeah. Um, Hebrews chapter 7 onwards starts talking about Jesus being a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Which let's, is a not, let's not get into that. But it's all about, but it's all about high pri- yeah. priesthood. Yeah. Let's just give it at that. But the, but the priesthood is relevant yeah. because what we've talked about in our last couple of episodes mm. was how the priesthood was established as a way mm. of God who was other than the Israelites, yep. other than, completely other than the people, living being holy and living in the midst in mm. the camp, yep. which is crazy. Mm. He lived there, and he, the system he set up for that to happen without mm. him just destroying everybody <laughs> was the tabernacle and the priesthood. Mm. Yep. That's why that's relevant. Yeah. So this this is a discussion on how Jesus is um, priest of a high priest of a new covenant, yep. which is a better covenant mm. and has a better priesthood. Right, and then he goes on to in chapter nine talking about worship in the earthly tabernacle, and he starts off talking about the most holy place, which the high priest could only enter once a year and not without blood. Um, he actually says in here something like that, which was to protect him. Yeah, to yeah. protect him. Yeah. yeah. So this is the context that we're mm. going into later, and and then going on, he talks about how. Blood was used in that, which we know from what we've looked at in the Old Testament. Blood, because the life is in the blood, does this kind of thing that's hard for us. We don't understand the mechanics of it, Mm. but it does this thing where it covers over the sin and mortality. It's not buying buying God off. As we said last last week, it's not buying God off, but it's covering. um, I remember once we had this dust storm here in the city, Adelaide, and the dust, even though it had all the windows down, it still got in under the doors and got in through the ceiling. I don't know how it got in, but everything was covered in dust and everything was dirty. Yeah. And it's kind of like that, that the the blood of the atonement just covers the dust of death that gets on everything and everyone. And it, it cleanses it because there's life, which is opposed to opposite to death. So, um, but it's not, it's not a buy-off, it's a covering and a protection, like a wearing an asbestos suit in a room full of fire, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And the covering, and it's to give access. Yeah. So the whole point of the of the atoning, the blood in atonement, was to cover over the impurities mm. to give access. Yep. To to God. Yep. And so, in light of that, it goes on, and um, you probably need to read it for yourself. There's a lot in here, and it can mm. can get a bit complicated. But from verse 18, so after he's talking about the um, Christ as the mediator of a new covenant and that covenant is established with blood. Yep. So blood is used in the whole heap of stuff. Yep. It's not all atonement. Yeah, so covenant, covenant and atonement, even though they're interrelated, are not the same thing. Yeah, they're not yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, which can be confusing because there's blood, there's blood in the Passover over the yep. doorway. There's yep. blood in the covenant. Mm-hmm. There's blood in... The fellowship offerings, which are mm. not about atonement, yep. but blood is still put on the altar. There's blood in consecration. There's blood yep. in atonement. <laughs> it's a bloody mess. <laughs> anyway, from verse 18, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. 
when Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. So he's mm. talking about how blood is used in the covenant. Yep. Blood is sprinkled on the people mm-hmm. and it's a thing of covenant. Then he goes on to say, in the same way, mm-hmm. as in like sprinkling of blood, yep. he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies, which we talked about last time. Mm-hmm. Um, how blood was used to consecrate the priests and their robes and the altar and in the Day of Atonement, the most holy place. And so from verse 22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Not nearly everyone, mm-hmm. but nearly everything. Yep. So we've talked about how the altar was atoned for mm-hmm. and the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, was atoned for or the mercy seat on the Ark was atoned for and um, different utensils were atoned for. So, so yeah, but then someone's going to point to the rest of verse 22. And, yeah, I'll continue on yeah, that. Yeah, read that. Yeah. Um, so, and then verse 22 continues, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, which is a famous line. Famous, very famous. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But what is the context of that? Yeah. The whole verse is, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything yeah. So it's talking about things being cleansed and atoned for and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Well, there's no context for forgiveness it would be another way of looking at that perhaps. Well, again, um, I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, but Michael Heiser talks about in the in Leviticus where it talks about atonement being made and forgiveness, yep. that forgiveness there means being wiped clean. That's right. Not It's not talking about um, those covering the sins of the high hand again. Yeah, so um, utensils and objects and the altar Mm. are forgiven Mm -hmm. by blood, meaning they're wiped clean of their impurity from Mm -hmm. being earthly. Yeah, so they're neutralized. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Then it goes on from verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified. So there's the key word, purified, Mm -hmm. which we've talked about, with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Mm. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Mm. To appear for us in God's presence. So in the Old Testament tabernacle system, God's Mm. presence was in the most holy place. Yep. And the priest could only enter there once a year and only with the sacrifice of blood. Yeah, and he's entering on behalf of all the other human beings and he's not entering in some kind of judicial way. He's not, you know, uh, coming like a a lawyer. A priest priest is different to a lawyer. And I think we've somehow in the West have got this courtroom drama and superimposed it on this whole thing, which which is, uh, again, bringing a Western ideology into an ancient system whereas a priesthood is a whole different thing so priesthoods are like a mediator a mediator they yeah. represent humans to god a go between yeah go between yeah. Mm. The, the the high priest was the representative of the nation that could come before god and the high priest himself was just one of the sinners who needed to also have his problems personally dealt with before he could represent everyone else as well mm. So, yeah. But Jesus doesn't have that problem. No. Which Hebrews goes on to say. Mm. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way a high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Other, otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifices of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Mm. There's a lot of things going on in that passage and we don't want to get uh, too sidetracked into the whole meaning of the book of Hebrews but just into this idea of uh, Christ being a um, superior High priest and offering a superior sacrifice. Mm-hmm. 
that the things that were before were only a sketch of things to come. Um, in fact, it goes on in chapter 10 to say that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. And as I like to think of it, it's like the difference between a blueprint for a, for a new house and a new house. The blueprint, you can't live in the, in the blueprint, but you need the blueprint in order to order the way that the new house is going to be. I had something similar at home. I had blueprints made up for an extension to the house, but now I live in the extension and the blueprints are in the filing cabinet. And the old covenant is a bit like that. It's, it's a necessary pattern of things to come. But now the real thing, the real house that we now live in is Jesus and the life he lived and the death he died and his making access for us to God the Father through uh, the temple or into the new temple through the living curtain, which is his body, as it goes on to say in chapter 19, verse 19 rather. So it's it's uh, comparing the two again and just saying Jesus is the once and for all. It, this is it. No, you don't have to keep on repeating it because it's perfect. Yeah, and he uses all the language of um, the uh, uses the atonement language of purification. Yeah, he went. Um, they're not copies of heavenly things being purified, but yeah. the heavenly things themselves being purified. Yeah. So it's not just people, but somehow the heavenly things are being purified mm. as well, yeah. which is a strange concept. <laughs> we don't want to get into the mechanics of how that works. No. I don't know. Because we don't know. <laughs> we, don't, no. we don't know. Yep. The, the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is that um, Jesus is superior to the old system. Mm. And so in the old system you needed atoning to mm. be able to draw near. Yep. Not at, you didn't need atoning to be brought into the community. That was mm. something different. Mm. Um, like the Passover and rescue and covenant and law giving, that was all different. All by blood, but not atoning blood. Just yeah, but not atoning thing. blood. Yeah. And you could say there's an element of holy making in that mm. was setting apart or making yep. distinct with the blood. Mm. But atonement for sin is a distinct thing that comes um into the picture after, yep. after you're part of the covenant community, mm-hmm. how do you then access God who's there? Mm-hmm. There's the priesthood that represents the people and um, that is done by blood sac- atonement, uh, sacrifices of atonement mm. with blood that somehow cleanses of impurity to give access. Yep. That's the point of that whole system to give access, mm. not to get into the community but to give access when you're in the community. Yep. And so then um, Jesus does that for the new covenant community in a greater way. Yeah. One sacrifice that covers it all. Yeah. Not doesn't need to be repeated. And Jesus as the true human and a better, so you have to go back into earlier stuff in Hebrews to yeah. see this, more of this, but he's a better high priest. Yeah. Uh, he's a superior high priest that offers a superior sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So that whole system of holy making is covered so that we can get to Verse 14, because by the one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Yeah. So the covenant community, the people of God, are the people chosen by God or called by God to be his people. Mm. And they need to be um, made holy to draw near. Yeah. By Jesus' blood, they're made in the in the new covenant, made holy. Uh, well, made, or made, being made holy, but are made perfect. Made perfect forever. Being made holy. And that word perfect isn't uh, made perfectly moral. It means they're brought to the goal, which is to be cleansed, and they are cleansed forever in order that they can then go into this life of being made holy with the eventual um, destiny of uh, welcoming the salvation which is being kept for us in heaven. And uh, not not going to heaven, by the way, <laughs> but it's been kept for us, as mm-hmm. I said in that in chapter nine, the verse last verse, that um, that he will bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. So that's got a future idea to it. But we have been kept and made perfect and brought to that goal in Christ right now, yep. and that's forever. And uh, so that that whole idea of atonement there is about not again not moral perfection but about being made right with God so that we can have fellowship. So, yeah. Yeah. So it answers the question of, Mm. okay, in the new covenant community, how do we get access to God? Because we're still like not 
perfect. Mm. Do, how do we do? We need to keep doing the. Do we still need to have this temple and sacrificial system to draw near to worship? Mm. The answer is no. Yeah, because Jesus, as a, there's a new priesthood. Mm-hmm. That's what it says earlier in Hebrews. There's a new priesthood, a new high priest, mm-hmm. and one sacrifice that um, covers all sins. Yeah, in that regard, mm. so that the people of God can have fellowship and access to God. Yeah. And it's actually in a stronger way. We're not going to get into it in this episode in terms of looking at all the scriptures, but there's mm-hmm. lots in the New Testament about the about Christians being um, a royal priesthood yeah. and a holy nation, mm-hmm. and we are, and also being a new temple. Yeah, we are living stones being built into the new temple. Yeah, which is you know the tabernacle and the temple had to be consecrated and made holy. Mm-hmm. Um, we all are priests and they can have access for free. in the in the ancient Israel mm-hmm. there was a hierarchy system the high priest could go into the most holy place and only once a year mm-hmm. then there was priests who um, could do other stuff with sacrifices and in the tabernacle but mm-hmm. couldn't go into the most holy place yeah and then there was the Le- Levites who could um, their job was to deal with the stuff related to the tabernacle, mm-hmm. but they couldn't do anything related to the sacrifices. Mm-hmm. And then there was all the other people that could bring sacrifices, mm-hmm. but had to that had to be mediated by the priesthood. So there was like a scale of there's a hierarchy of who could get drawn near. Yeah, and the and you could get closer and closer and closer the higher up the hierarchy you were. Yeah. So uh, and and then what happens after that is. Now everyone in the new covenant, it's open to everyone. There is no hierarchy. There's no hierarchy. We it's, have one high priest yep. representing all of us yep. who has gone into the heavenly mm-hmm. most holy place. Yep. And we have, so here's the result. In um, Hebrews 10 verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way that opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. And all of that, of course, is old covenant language there about the you know the sprinkling of water. And, and in, the, in the old system the blood of the animals didn't actually take away the guilt of sin. But here it actually deals with every aspect of it and totally cleanses us. It does an internal work, not just an external. Yeah, so it's not an external thing that works it works from the outside in, but it's an internal thing that works from inside out. Yeah. And that's the whole idea of the Holy Spirit, you know, coming inside of us, not just coming anointing us on the outside, but coming inside of us and bringing that reality to us. Which, of course, goes back to the um, references to the Old Covenant where the promises were made in Jeremiah 31, 31, that everyone will know the Lord, not just not just the, the elite priesthood or just a handful of people. In fact, we might as well actually read it. Yeah? Well, um, Hebrews quotes um, Jeremiah a couple of times yeah, because it's a really important theme. The New Covenant is right. a really important theme to Hebrews, writer of Hebrews. So in chapter 8 from verse 11, um, maybe I'll read from verse, verse 10. Verse 10, yeah. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. So that's this, this thing. Of, it's internal. Yeah. It's not just external because yeah. elsewhere in Hebrews it talks about how the rituals um, in the tabernacle and the priestly system was all external. Yeah. It was all external ritual mm. and related to um, food and drink and ceremony. Yeah. The new covenant goes deep, penetrates deeper. Mm-hmm. And goes in, God says, "I will put my laws in their laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, "Know the Lord." Because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then we have in Hebrews 10 from 19, therefore, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Mm. What, we have confidence to enter the most holy place? (laughs) That's only for the high priest and only once a year. Yeah. 
not anymore. And, of course, all of that is uh, brought out in the actual crucifixion story. You probably remember how at the moment that Jesus died, at that very moment the temple curtain actually tore from top to bottom, top to bottom, which, of course, is significant because this is God's doing. God is tearing it from his position and opening it up down towards humanity and saying now the Holy of Holies is not only open to the priesthood but to everyone and as we're going to see, not only to the Jews but to the Gentiles as well. So yeah. it's kind of uh, a tearing open of this fellowship with God that's now made available to everyone and anyone, no matter what your status, no matter uh, whether you're Jewish or Gentile or whether you're great or small. And uh, you've got to ask yourself the question, what was actually going on in the Temple of Temple, I mean in the Holy of Holies? What's going on there is the fellowship of God himself Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and now Jesus the Son has opened up this way for us to enter into the same fellowship that he has with God the Father. And this this is where the whole, you know, the ministry of the Spirit really um, takes over because in this internal thing, this transforming work of the Spirit comes in. We're not just taught about God and know things about God. We actually come to actually know God. Um, and from the least to the greatest, you will know God. What does that mean? To know God like Jesus knows the Father is ultimately what um, this fellowship is, is, is about. In mm. fact, Jesus, even in his high priestly prayer, and this brings us back to this priesthood of Jesus, he said, I sanctify myself. I think it's in John 17 verse 9. He says, I sanctify myself that they may be truly sanctified. And no, what does sanctified mean? It means set, I set myself apart. I consecrate myself. It's related to holiness, isn't it? To, to holiness, yeah. setting myself aside for you, but I'm doing it for them. So I, what I have done, they, they are including what I've done for them and I've done it to them in a, in a, in a sense. But uh, we were talking about this before, that, that holiness is not dispensed like out of a ladle on different individuals. Rather, Jesus is the one who makes holy. And then if we're in Christ by giving our allegiance to him and trusting in him and putting our uh, faithfulness with him, we enter into what belongs to him so that, he says, on the day of the Spirit, you'll know that uh, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and you are in me, which is another way of saying that you'll enter into the fellowship that I have with the Father. And that's what was going on behind the Holy of Holies. And that is the ultimate goal of and purpose of being made holy yeah. is so that we have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another and not just fellowship with people who are alive today but fellowship with the saints that were before and those that are yet to come. And that's all represented in when we take communion, when we remind ourselves of the Passover lamb and the overcoming of death. And, you know, all these things are all mixed in together and yet – that the, 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 there are distinct gifts that are all part of it, but I think sometimes in the um, in the Western Church we have uh, kind of just piled them all up together and just caught it one big thing and said yeah, that that's all that's all atonement the whole yeah. lot that's yeah. all atonement. Yeah. Uh, where whereas yes they're all mixed in together and interrelated just like the human body has all these interrelated systems, but the nervous system isn't the digestive system and atonement is not the same as covenant. It's and yet they're all interconnected. Mm. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's beautiful, it's big. And this gift that we have uh, does relate to the pattern that we see in the old covenant. So we, we, we must not just ignore the old covenant pattern. The more we understand the old covenant pattern, the more we'll appreciate what's really going on in the new covenant. Yeah. And like we've talked about with the old covenant pattern, there wasn't substitution. Mm. There wasn't... Um, the animal wasn't being punished yep. to take the penalty of the human to mm. then appease God's wrath. No. It was a different system. Mm. There was the life of the blood making people and objects mm. holy to be able to be in the presence of God. Yeah. And so that's what that's what we see here mm. in, in Hebrews, that Jesus died uh, in his um, death offering purification for sins. In and the, also it says that yep. it took, took away sins. Yep. So there, there is the scapegoat idea as well that he took sin and took them away. Yeah, and again we're saying that the scapegoat isn't paying for the sins but is carrying the sins away in, in symbolising how far away they're removed yep. and how, how thoroughly they're dealt with. 
So Jesus has thoroughly dealt with that and taken them away. So he as it, mm. he combina- combines taking sins away mm. in a removal and purifying us and the yeah. heavenly tabernacle for our so we can have a relationship yeah, in making, a holy making yeah. holy making made, made perfect forever. Yeah, yes, but that's not a transaction where mm. he's punished for our sin, which then. Um, Evens up placates the books. or placates God balances the books so yeah. that God's okay with that. None of that is happening yeah. here. And, and atonement doesn't change God. Atonement changes us. So atonement is never pointed towards changing the mind of God towards us. It's not like, oh, all right, now because of atonement, now I can accept you. It's not that. It's more now that atonement has been made for us. Now we are at liberty to enter into the most holy place because we are no longer um, um, what, it's subnatural, um, subholy. Now we've been made perfect forever in the order of, um, or according to um, to what Christ has done for us. So much to say. I was, we're running out of time. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Should we look at First John? Yeah, I think that's. I think that's. Probably, let's just wrap it up there because I would love to go back into Hebrews and just talk about you know, the life that Jesus offered on our behalf uh, in Hebrews chapter 9 and all that, that's probably for another occasion. That's a big that's conversation. That's a big conversation, yeah. So let's, yeah, let's have a look at 1 John. All right, so uh, 1 John is the other book that references atonement specifically mm-hmm. a number of times. Um, like we've said before, there's different sacrifices mm-hmm. and different blood things that are related to sacrifices and Therefore, Jesus' sacrifice. And there's some passages in the New Testament that mix everything all together. Yeah. And there's some that delineate the specific ones. Yeah. And um, when atonement is talked about, it's often delineated as mm. a specific thing. Yeah. Like in Hebrews that mm. we looked at and like in First John. And as we'll be able to see here in First John, it's related to maintenance of the people that are already in the covenant community. Yeah. It's not the way to get in. That's right. Um, so in First John chapter 1, um, I'll read from verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he in, is in the light, and before that he said if you walk in darkness, you're not in the light and no. you don't have fellowship with God. Yep. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And that, and that word, That's atonement language, yeah, purification. It, it's worth noting too that the, that, that, that the sense there purifies is goes on purifying. It's not yeah. just something you weren't just purified and that's it. It's the, There's a reason for it going on, which I think you're going to explain. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason it's going on mm. because – and this is probably a question that a lot of Christians have yeah. about sin. So then it goes on to talk about if you claim you don't have sin, you're a liar yeah. because we all still sin. Yeah, so that, that again gets back to this, okay, so I'm made perfect and yet I'm still subject to sin. Yeah. So then he goes on verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that there's that idea of ongoing purification, main, maintenance of fellowship with yeah. God and with one another. Yeah, and there's confession yeah. involved. Yeah. Which is, I mean, bringing a sin offering was a form of confession in the yeah. um, old system because mm-hmm. it was an acknowledgement. Yeah. It was an acknowledgement of wrongdoing and, a ro- and a, not just wrongdoing because it wasn't all related to wrongdoing. No. There was either an acknowledgement of wrongdoing or an, just an acknowledgement of being deficient. And a reception, there's a kind of a reception of what God is supplying rather than making your own way, you're saying, I need your way. Yeah. And uh, the word confession, in one of the ways it uh, can be translated, is to literally um, agree with and say the same thing as someone say if a policeman pulls me over and says are you aware that you were over the speed limit and i say yes i was over the speed limit i've literally said the same thing which means i'm in agreement and so guilty as charged therefore in need and in this case in need of of uh, ongoing purification and mercy and there is this uh, 
uh, ongoing purification through the one sacrifice of Jesus once and for all. There's not new sacrifices that have to be made. In fact, if we went back into Hebrews chapter 10, it actually warns against doing that, making new sacrifices or slipping back into that way of thinking because then you cut yourself off from Christ because mm. there's only one sacrifice for sin, sacrifice of Jesus, that's it. Yep. No, there's no new ones that can be added. And so this idea that we can somehow, uh, again, trade with God, just that that you can't, it's just not, just not there. Yeah. So... And it goes on in chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So that idea of speaking to the Father in our defense is uh, alludes to the high priestly role. Yeah, not, not the, a lawyer role. The yeah. mediation of the high priest. Yeah. Yeah. Which, again from Hebrews, Jesus is a new high, the new high priest. So As a human High priest. Yeah, and he's our representative, not our, not our, the payer of our sins, mm. but he's representing us as the pure high priest. Mm. Then it goes on, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Mm. That's major. Yeah. So here we have this picture of um, the maintenance of the covenant community by ritual purification. Mm which is bigger and way bigger and way better in Jesus. Yeah. It's a once for all and it covers the the new community, but it also covers not just the Jews. Mm-hmm. It covers the whole world. Yeah. Which means that we haven't really talked about this, but one of the big things about the new covenant is that it included all the nations. Yeah. All the nations could come in. That was a big deal. Yeah. That's a major turning point in Acts when the Gentiles start converting. Mm. And John's saying that this new system of atonement through Jesus' blood is uh, covers everything for the new community, including it's so expansive it, in, it covers everyone who enters the new community, covenant community from mm. any nation in the world, yeah. from any people group and from any background. Yeah. Covers all makes everybody holy mm. to come in. Yeah. So it's bigger and it's better. Yeah. But again, we see the picture that it's maintenance. Mm. It's it's uh, this is ongoing maintenance for the people who are this isn't how you come into the community. Yeah. It's how relationship is actually maintained with when you're in the community. Yeah. Which is where atonement where atonement worked in the old system and mm. it's also where it works in the new system. Mm-hmm. So it's really important but it's not the picture that covers everything about Jesus' death. No. And finally, we should probably talk about one of the most famous verses in the New Testament talking about Jesus' death, which is in Romans chapter 3. And we don't want to unpack everything here because that's (laughs) (laughs) too much, way too much. Little old Romans are such a simple book. Oh, Romans, yeah. (laughs) Romans is the book that I tell new believers to read. I'm like, just go read Romans. That will clear everything up for you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Romans is really rich, but it's also really complicated. Mm. So here's one of the most famous scriptures um, that most – It's, it's on Romans Road. This most th- From the Romans Road, yeah. from Romans chapter 3, which says from verse 23 – For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God Mm -hmm. and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Verse 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So there's another passage where it clearly talks about Jesus' blood being a sacrifice of atonement. Now, we probably need to do a whole series on Romans. (laughs) Yeah. Because we haven't done that. No. And we don't want to spend hours talking about it. No. We're not going to explain some things, just cut to the chase and say it. Yeah. Romans as a book has a number of themes, but the big theme of it is how do Jews and Gentiles now make up the new covenant community of God, Mm. the people of God, the family of God. used to be because the Jews were the chosen people. Yep. And they and part of their being chosen was excluding themselves from the other nations, being separate from mm. them. 
But hold on a second. Now Gentiles, all the other nations can be included in the family of God. Mm-hmm. And so we see in a number of parts in the New Testament, this controversy is arising as they're trying to work out this messy thing. Hold on. In this new system, in the new covenant, but if the Gentiles included, how does that happen and what mm. does that mean? Do they mm. need to be circumcised? So Galatians. Yeah. Do they need to be circumcised? Should Do they need to come under the Mosaic covenant to be in the new covenant? Do mm. they need to follow the Mosaic laws? Mm. And uh, et cetera. Mm. That's a big theme of Galatians. In Romans, it's also a big theme. There's this idea of well, how do working out how do Jews and Gentiles be together in the same church. That's the biggest theme in Romans and it gets into all these details along the way and other stuff. Yep. And so earlier in chapter 3, Paul's talking about, um, you know, again, this famous thing of there is no one righteous, not mm. even one. Mm. It goes on to quote, that's a Old Testament quote and there's a number of Old Testament quotes and the conclusion is that, um, Paul's point that he's making there is that, okay, you Jews think that you're special because you're Jews and you've got the law. But look, your own Old Testament criticizes you. Yeah. So having the law and having the Mosaic covenant clearly didn't make you righteous. Yeah. So why do you think you're better? Yeah. And that's where it goes on to say, before the verse that I read, for all have sinned, it starts with, There is no difference, Mm -hmm. meaning between Jews and Gentiles. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles because all have sinned and all fall short, Mm -hmm. whether you've got the law or you don't have the law, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I'm not going to talk about all the stuff in that verse. (laughs) But this is the context. Relative to that, Mm -hmm. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. Mm. Covering both. Covering Jew both, the, Jews Jew and, Gentile. and Gentiles. Yeah. So the Jews, so this question of how can Gentiles be in the community of the people of God alongside Jews? Do things need to be different for mm. them? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow the Mosaic mm. Covenant? Paul's saying in regards to atonement and being made holy and having access to God. Yep. Yeah. Gentiles are not inferior to Jews Mm -hmm. because for both groups, God has presented Jesus as an atoning sacrifice. A super sacrifice. So the Gentiles are covered by that as well. Mm -hmm. So this sacrifice of atonement is bigger and more expansive. It includes, like we saw in 1 John, the Mm -hmm. whole world. It includes all the nations and all the people groups. Mm -hmm. So everyone has access. That's, Everybody that's has really access. the point. And the atonement in the Old Testament was about access. Atonement in the new system is access. Yep. And he talks about forgiveness of sins freely by grace, which is a whole different thing, which, again, we're not going to get into that right now. Um, and But the atonement side of it is about making ready for fellowship yep. in the presence of God and also building community as well yep. on top of that. So, yeah, it's uh, it's not... The way the way it's put here, and if you if you put this alongside the old the old covenant, then what you're seeing is about fellowship again, rather than about paying for sins. And yet somehow we have piled up all of the images uh, from the Old Testament and just sort of said, "Oh, it's all too complicated. Let's just say Jesus pays for sins, yeah. and it's, and and His blood somehow um, pays my way and um, makes up for." Uh, my my immorality, so that I can, so God won't be angry with me anymore. Um, it it that doesn't do justice to the old covenant, nor to the argument that Paul is making. I mean, Paul has gone to a lot of trouble here to try to make a very complex uh, argument for the both the Jew and the Gentile. But he's the bottom line that he's trying to get to here is uh, because of the problems that were going on in the Roman Church at the time. He was saying you're all equal, you're all one people before God. There is no now Jew or Gentile anymore. You're all one in Christ. That's it. Yeah. And that uh, and that is through – and so the atonement gives access to both. And at no point in this does he – and does he say this is paying for your sins? Otherwise he would have said that. Mm. I mean Paul is a good arguer. He knows how to use language. 
I'm pretty sure that if he wanted to make that point, he would have actually made that point, but we don't see him making that point. Yeah, and because we know that a, a sacrifice of atonement, and mm. particularly the Day of Atonement, which is what's being referenced here, because mm. the word God presented him, in Greek it says God presented him as a hilasterion, mm -hmm. which is um, what the atone, what the mercy seat or atonement cover in the most holy place was called. Yep. Um, the Greek word for that. I mean, it was in Hebrew, but mm. in the Septuagint, mm. the mercy seat is called the hilasterion. Yeah. So it's referring to the Day of Atonement where in the most holy place, the mercy seat or atonement cover or the ark, covering of the ark, was atoned for. Mm. And he's saying that God has put forward Christ as an atoning sacrifice mm -hmm. according to the Day of Atonement mm. for Jews and Gentiles, yeah. which means that uh, both groups are covered. Mm -hmm. Both groups, groups are purified to have access. Yeah. So this hierarchy of high priest and priest and everybody else, mm -hmm. that's done away with. This hierarchy of Jews are better than Gentiles, that's done away with. Mm -hmm. In the new system, the atoning sacrifice gives access to God, cleansing, um, purification and cleansing and mm -hmm. access to God for, for all of the new covenant community. Yeah. And it's a big deal. <laughs> Gentiles yeah. could be priests in the new covenant. Yeah. Part well, of we're all priests, yeah. everyone. I mean, that's, You're yeah, a priest, that's the I'm thing. a priest, he's a priest, you know. <laughs> not only were they not, not excluded, they could be priests. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. That's what's happening hmm. here. So hopefully this gives a, a bit more clarification for a tricky topic that you can't really pin down. No. We want to make that clear. You can't really pin it all down, but hmm. and we can hopefully be a bit clearer, yeah. a bit clearer on it. If, if nothing else, what we're, all, we, all we're trying to do here is to say, look, the, old, the pattern of the Old Covenant is not just there for, you know, to, for some sort of joke. It's there because it is a pattern of the, of the thing that is to come. So if you don't understand the pattern, you're not going to understand what's going on here and you'll read into it patterns that are already in your head, such as, um, a, you know, kind of a paying off system, which is yep. kind of instinctive spirituality in everyone's head, or you'll bring Western ideas into it. And and we must let the pattern of the old covenant shape our understanding of the new, because this is one big book. It's not it's not um, it's not kind of a, a, an old book that you don't have to really worry about anymore. With this new book, and you know why why publish it all together if you're not if it's not meant to be together? It's mm. meant to be together. We're meant to see the whole thing as one big story, one big narrative from beginning to end. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I think. We could talk forever. Trust me, we could talk forever. But uh, I, shall we leave it there? I think for now. I think yeah. I think we should leave it there. Yeah. On atonement. Yeah. But if you remember from our first episode on why did Jesus die and the Venn diagram, that atonement is only a portion mm. of the sacrifices, and sacrifice is only a portion of why Jesus died. So yeah. there's more to talk about. Yeah. So if Jesus is the Lamb of God, He is all the lambs. And not just the Lamb of Atonement, not just the Lamb of the Passover, but and not just the Lamb of a Covenant, yeah, and not just the scapegoat, yeah. He's he's all he's all of them all together, um, and yet he fulfills all of the roles of all of those different uh, different lambs uh, or different sacrifice sacrifices. He is the sacrifice par excellence, who fulfills all of the law and the uh, the law and the prophets. Um, but we must still keep the pattern that is in the old in order to understand what's going on in the new. Yeah. Because that's the pattern we've got. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was deliberate. Yeah. All right. Well, let's leave it there for now because we'll go crazy trying to cover it all. And I know that we've probably raised more questions than answers, um, but hopefully over the time you'll begin to see that uh, this, uh, this broad thing works its way out because we're going to continue to talk about why did Jesus die over the next few weeks and it just keeps getting better and better. And if you have questions, feel free to send them to us, put them in the comments. Yeah, yeah. So. Or we've got a Facebook page if you're not 
if you haven't liked our Facebook page, you should probably do that. Yeah, and we also have a, a web page as well. And if you're looking for easy access to the podcast and to the YouTube channel, you just go to godwit.com.au and up in the right-hand corner, you can just click on the icon for the podcast or the icon for YouTube and that's just the easiest way to find your way around the internet there. Yeah, so please send us your comments and questions and we're happy to engage with those. Okay, well, bye for now. See ya.